So today, uh, we're having a, a little bit of a different format here. My wife, Grace, this is my wife, Grace, my beautiful wife, Grace, yep. Uh, we're going to be sharing a talk today about marriage, um, but before we, we do this, I wanted to make sure you heard about this. Um, Taylor Swift's boyfriend is going to be playing at the Usher concert this weekend. I just want everybody to be uh, aware. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got a special. What's this? Let me see what this is. I don't know what this is. Let me open it up. Oh, Wow. Uh, Taylor Swift has landed in Los Angeles, guys. Just want everybody to know that. This was a lot funnier in my head. I, <laughs> I said, bring, it, bring some paper out, let's do this. And I appreciate the courtesy laughs across the room. Thank you so much. Uh, she finishes her tour in Tokyo. But I'm glad some of you were in your jerseys for the Super Bowl weekend. Just by applause, I'm just curious. How many of you think the Kansas City Chiefs are going to win? Just out of applause. No, just applause. Somebody else. Uh, how about, how, I'm just kidding with you. How about, how about that other team, San Francisco 49ers? I'm just, it's kind of close. It's kind of close. It's kind of close. I was talking to someone and I was asking them, or they were asking me which team I'm going to root for. And like, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle, to be honest with you. And I, I told them, I just told them the Niners. And they said, well, you better root for the other one because if they win, I'm going to give something to the church. And I'm like, well, <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll root for them then as well. So we're, this is our last weekend. We've been talking about therapy sessions. That's the title of the series we've been doing for a number, number of weeks. And we've had a lot of positive feedback from this series. There's been a lot of people looking at all of our videos on YouTube and online. It's been really beautiful. Uh, and praise the Lord. The Lord just, I believe, touched this series, and a lot of us could identify with working through stuff. And uh, today we, we, uh, we talked, you know what? Uh, we're going to share some rules for marriages. And uh, whether you're married or single, hello. Um, there's something here for you. In fact, it's way better for you when you're single to understand the rules of marriage before you get into that relationship. <laughs> it's way better to figure it out now versus getting into the relationship or whatever it might be. Um, we have all kinds of uh, ver all kinds of definitions, I guess, of uh, what a good marriage is and what it's about. Um, Grace and I are up here. Uh, this does not mean we have it all together. So let's just make sure that's loud and clear. We do not have it all together. But God has uh, certainly been with us and carried us through a lot. So, wife, this is my wife, Grace. Why don't you share a little bit, baby? Well, well, hello, everyone. It's great to see you. And it's always uh, really an honor to be up here with my husband. I mean, he's definitely the one with the gift. So I want to make that, that very clear. Uh, but, you know, it's just fun to be up here talking about something that means a lot to us. So as you can, as my husband shared, we've been married 32 years. And that seems like a long time, but I'm going to tell you, it just goes by so fast. I mean, life happens so fast, and it's fun, and it's great when you can come together in a, in a godly uh, relationship, in a godly marriage, and really focus on, you know, focus, put your marriage um, uh, with, you know, just with God, and, and have him um, help you through the ups and downs of life. So much happens. So um, I just want to share, there's, there's going to be a picture up on the screen. That is a picture of my beautiful family. And most of you know uh, our son, Josiah, who's married to Kaylee, our sweet, beautiful Kaylee, who was up here um, not, not, you know, a few minutes ago. And then Hannah, who's away in college. Um, so as you can see, um, we've been through a lot. I mean, raising two adult children now, uh, that tells you that we've been through a lot. Our marriage has been through a lot of good things and a lot of tough things. I'm going to start off with some scripture here. It's always good to look at God's word first. Genesis chapter 1 says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image. To be like us, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Do you want to read that next section? Sure. There, well, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. 
So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild, wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, the one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. I read that, verse 23, one bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. Um, oh, verse 22 says, I made a woman from the rib. And as you get, a lot of you know this, but for the longest time, I'd introduce Grace as my rib. And she didn't find that very funny. So I had to stop doing that. She calls me chocolate stallion all the time. In... <laughs> I'm supposed to say I'm going to give up chocolate for Lynn. <laughs> All right, baby. You want to read the, the next quote, baby? Let's just jump to that quote. Well, what if God designed marriage to make you holy instead of happy? I think often we think that when we get married, it's supposed to be uh, a lot of fun, a lot of happiness, a lot of joy, no fighting, no arguing, right? No contention. Uh, but you know what? It's two human beings, two fallen human beings that come together mm. and are married. And of course, we're going to bring in so much uh, into the marriage, and it's usually not, uh, it takes a lot to make your marriage happy. Mm. Wouldn't you agree? Are you going to read the next quote too? The same quote by Gary Thomas, what if your relationship? So what if the relationship isn't as much about you and your spouse as it is about you and God? Mm. I was, um, <clears throat> you were, well, I don't know how intimate to be, but I was in the shower talking to Grace. She wasn't in the shower. <laughs> she was out of the shower. Anyway, I told, I was, my, you know how you think in the shower? I, I think in the shower. And I, I told her, I think uh, marriage is this conveyor belt of intense transformation and challenges. Because I think it's a lot of, I mean, Paul the Apostle said, hey, you know what? It's better not to get married. Because you only have to please God. <laughs> you only have to please God. Uh, but I, I think about marriage when you're thrown into a relationship with someone. And typically when you're saying I do to all of these things, you know, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, for whatever. And it's just I do, I do. And it's like the unicorn is jumping from cloud to cloud in your mind and everything's amazing. And then when you, when you uh, say I do and you make this commitment, you realize you know, like, like we got to grow together and like, you're still here. Wow. Okay. Well, we got to do this together and we got to work through this together. Um, marriage is this sacred institution created by God and it's between a man and a woman. And the purpose of this is oneness. As Grace said, this could be hard. We have two different Enneagrams. We two different, two different numbers here. Right. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, it almost seems like we're opposites. Um, he, I am a a helper, which means that um, I tend to be more caring, and Inter my interpersonal type is demonstrative, generous. My strengths are caring. I, I value relationships, and and that I think that is that is definitely true for me. While my husband, you wouldn't be surprised, is the achiever. Uh, that means he's success oriented, pragmatic. Um, he's driven and uh, and image conscious, and then his strengths are commanding, direct protective and very take charge. So do you think we have conflict in our marriage? <laughs> yeah, and both of us are firstborns. That, that, that's <laughs> like, if you look at studies, two firstborns argue a lot. A anyone firstborns, you're with another firstborn, yeah, that's a challenge. Um, so it, 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 there's this um, movie, I think it was called Open Range. Do you guys remember this whole movie? With I think Kevin Costner was in it. And he turned to his woman and he said in his cowboy accent, you know, uh, sitting on his horse, he said, how's this going to work if you don't do what I say? <laughs> 
He said that to his wife. I said that to her so many times, and she just laughs at me. She doesn't, she doesn't get it. Why don't you share? Um, check out this stat. Check it out. Couples who attend church weekly are 47% less likely to, divor- to divorce. That's pretty significant, isn't it? I mean, couples who say, hey, let's put God first. And I'm so grateful at this church. We have a lot of people who date. Uh, people are singles, and they bring them to church. And I think that's a cool date. It's, it's way better than going to a restaurant and bringing them to church. And, uh, but there's some other uh, stats I uh, want to share. Do you want to talk about the average length of marriage? Is is eight years. Did you know that? So if you've been married longer than eight years, you've already beat the stats or go. the average. Good job. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty incredible. I did not realize that it's Share eight some years. of these other stats, too. Yeah, You're there's... There's a lot more that goes into marriage, obviously. So here's some stats that are really interesting. So more than friendship, laughter, forgiveness, compatibility, and sex, spouses name trust as the element crucial for a happy marriage. Trust. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, next one, baby. Uh, Due to jobs, kids, TV, the internet, hobbies, on and on, and family responsibility, um, the average married couple spends just four minutes a day uh, focusing uh, alone time with each other. Four minutes. I thought this was interesting. Cohabiting, living together before marriage, can pose a greater long-term relational risk. I thought that was interesting. Um, A study asked 500 married people over their marriage. 99% discovered that it was harder than they expected. Harder than that. You're laughing because, like, you think this is true, right? You know, it's like <laughs> you're laughing. Right. Go ahead, baby. So, and then over 40% of married couples in the U.S. include at least one spouse who has been married before. And then a 15 year long study found that a person's happiness level before marriage was the best predictor of happiness after the marriage. In other words, marriage won't automatically make you happy. Why don't you share? We, there's three myths I wanted to, I'll share with, with you. Myth number one, my spouse should always make me feel good about myself. Yeah, that doesn't always happen. She's really good. She, she's really good. Myth number two, my spouse should always be encouraging. Well, are you always encouraging? I mean, and myth number three, I should never feel lonely when I'm married. Nah, that's that's not that's not true at all. So let's share some uh, some rules for marriages. We got four of them. You want to go over the first one here? Sure. So uh, the first one is build your marriage on Christ. So that's that's kind of what I how I started uh, talking uh, this um, today for this message is that that's what we need. If you want to, this number one rule, if anything, it's really pivotal to have that foundation, that cornerstone. And I think it takes the two of us, the two of you. You know, it's hard when a marriage is one person who is close to, you know, God, who's going to church, who's trying to serve, who's trying to raise the kids to love God. And then you have another, the other spouse who's not that committed to to Christ, to the church, to, you know, it, 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 there's something that happens there. So I just think this, this first rule is the foundation, right? This is going to be the foundation of any good marriage. Um, let's see. Ephesians 5:21 through 33 tells us, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. All right. Thanks for coming to church, guys. Have a great week. <laughs> well, not so fast. There's it's another boring. part to this. <laughs> oh, my goodness. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault, without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. 
For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feels and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife and he, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. As I was reading that, I was thinking about a quote I came across. It's not in the notes here, but um, it's really easy to say, I do. It's really hard to become one. It's really easy to say, yeah, let's do this, but it's really hard to become one. Uh, it takes time. It's a process. There's, there's so much surrender to God. I, I think the other thing about this passage here is um, this decision to build your life on Jesus. Uh, truth is, um, you, uh, if it's not Jesus, it's something else or someone else. Maybe it's your own intellect. Maybe it's your own confidence. Maybe it's your own education. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's the kids or whatever it might be. And, and here, Paul the Apostle is saying, no, 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 check this out. If you really want to have a strong marriage, if you want to do it God's way, let's put it that way, according to scripture, then Jesus needs to be the center of it. Jesus needs to be the center of it. Uh, Tim Keller said this, men, you'll never be a good groom to your wife unless you first, you're first a good bride to Jesus. Isn't that good? And unless, see, that means love your wife as Christ loved the church. Never treat them harshly encourage them don't talk negatively about them to friends family or kids don't pull down your your wife like that don't do that you don't do that encourage them you never know one day they might be pushing you in a wheelchair across king sewer's parking lot or something like that so you better take care of your wife while you have breath um, develop a strong healthy personal relationship with with god and that's where it starts and that's kind of the, okay, here's our compass. Here's our north. Let's follow God's word. Here's our, here's our north. Let's look at the teachings of Jesus. So at some point there has to, if it's a, a joint decision to do that, and you're both going the, the same direction, it's a, it's a game changer. And uh, show her love with every opportunity. Um, you want to hear, you want to read that next quote? There sure. It is. So it's, um, so Lisa Terhurst. Uh, she's a really great um, author. Uh, she says, God doesn't want me to be a fix him wife. God wants me to be a love him wife. And, I, you know, what I'm going to add to that is this scripture is often misunderstood and, and often misquoted. And so I just have to, I have to say this because I think this has been sort of, again, another foundation in our marriage. Um, it, because when, when you listen to that piece of scripture that we just read, and it, it gave a, you know, a, a command really to the woman and to the man. So it's pretty equal. And what it's saying is, and this is what we've, you know, what we live in our home is husbands want to be respected and women want to be loved. And it's almost like a circle. Often what we, we think is uh, a husband thinks well or feels it because it's not something you really think through. It's just more of an emotion. It's what you feel. You, it's what you do, I suppose. And often what happens is the man, if the man doesn't feel respected, then he doesn't give love. But then if the woman doesn't feel love, she often doesn't give respect. So in that circle, something has to stop and change in order for the marriage to really work. That's good, baby. Lasting marriages are two people that have learned to die to themselves and live through Christ. And what I've discovered is that's a daily decision. That's a daily decision. It's, it's just like walking with Jesus. It's just like choosing to do life with God. It's a daily decision. And, uh, and that's been super important for us. Is, is, uh, I, I think she knows when I haven't been reading my Bible because my character changes. I think she knows that I'm not quite as tight as I should be with God, that something's happening. I think my words have a little edge to them, or, or I'm just not as kind or, or understanding or whatever it is. Rule number two. You want to read that one, babe? Forgive each other. 
go ahead and read that scripture. So right? Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 tells us, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Mm -hmm. A marriage is the union of two good forgivers. That's what Ruth Ann tells us. Yeah, um, I would say sometimes that's modeled in the home that you grew up in, and sometimes it's not. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, the home you grew up in, they did not learn how to have a conversation about sensitive things. They just knew how to get angry or something, or they just kind of told you the way it is kind of thing, and there was no conversation. So for us, we had to, we had to really uh, learn to work through things and ask for forgiveness and using the F word, because I think there's power in that F word. Uh, there's a spiritual transaction that takes place when you say, will you forgive me? As opposed to you just being silent and doing good things or something like that to let them know that you're over it. Or saying, hey, sorry, or changing the subject and driving down the road and saying, hey, that's a nice purple house. You know what I mean? I mean, it, there's something different when you work through that. Would you agree, baby? I hope you agree. I hope you agree. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. You know, um, I love what 1 Corinthians 13 uh, tells us. This, this is one of my favorite uh, pieces of scripture. I mean, they're, they're, it's really hard to pick one, but this is definitely one of my top up there. Uh, it says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I don't know, just reading it really, just every time I read the scripture, it just remind, reminds me of how love really is God's idea, if you think about it. Um, it's really interesting in our culture today, you know, you hear that, be kind, be loving, love wins, do you, you see that a lot. Well, where do they get this from, right? It's, it's in God's word. He is teaching us what true love is. And if you read each one of these attributes, um, they're not easy, are they? They really not, especially when you're you know, you're tired, you know, things aren't going your way, you're not getting along. It's, you know, I find that you have to make a choice. In the middle of an argument, in the middle when things are really tough, you have to make a choice because that's what love is, right? It is a choice. And you have to choose to be this kind of person in your home and in your marriage. Um. I'll give some advice to uh, our singles out there. Maybe you're looking, maybe you're trolling, or whatever it is, and you're thinking about it. Uh, when when uh, we were going through marriage counseling, before we got married, this would have been our premarital counseling way back when, and uh, my pastor, our pastor, gave some advice to me, and I'll never, I never forgot it. He said, everything is accentuated when you're married. So in your dating life, if he or she is let's say moody they're going to be really moody when they get married or let's say they're unkind they're going to be really unkind after you tie the knot or they're uh they have some hang up it's going to get worse afterwards um maybe it's pride or selfishness or a bad temper or they don't they don't care about church or whatever it is it's accentuated after you get married. Now, the other side is, is true also. If they're kind and loving on the front end after marriage, typically you see it even more. So it works both ways. And I'm saying that because sometimes I think when we're, you know, when you're in a dating relationship, you see something and you kind of minimize it and you think, oh, this is not a big deal. But it is a big deal on the other side. It's a really big deal. In fact, if they have issues with their parents, guess who's going to have issues on the other side? You're going to have issues with it unless you're going to inherit all that. So, so uh, just be aware of that. Sometimes we think, oh, when the marriage date, when it happens, there's transformation. Well, 
the only way transformation happens is by the Spirit of God. God is the one who is able to change hearts. And just because you have a, a piece of paper that says certificate of marriage doesn't mean they're a new character or a new person. So you have to pay attention when you're dating. Pay attention to who they are because everything is accentuated on, on the other side. Um, let's, uh, there's some things. Pick your battles. Not every issue is on which you should die. So pick your battles. Learn to laugh at yourself. I think that's something we've, we've really gotten better at is laughing at ourselves. And sometimes that's hard, especially if you have some pride and you just get angry if someone's laughing at you and you're like, what are you laughing about? You're going to get all upset and everything like that. But the truth is you're weird and I'm weird and we're all weird and we do weird things that sometimes don't make any sense. And it's okay. So learn to laugh together. Uh, never let your children come between you and your spouse or your in-laws or whoever or your job. You know, make sure the priority is, is you and your spouse. In our case, um, you know, Grace and I, the kids are gone, and our Grace's mom, um, Mama Sanchez, we affectionately call her, she lives with us in our basement. And uh, that's something, it's a new season for us that we're enjoying. Uh, we're enjoying, and we all certainly miss our kids, but taking care of, of Grace's mom and also adjusting to our freedom, um, our new season of life. It's been a growing thing for us. Would you have anything else to add with, uh, to that, Grace? Oh, and you know, that's in the 32 years that we've ma been married, we definitely have hit different seasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I've, I've shared this often when I'm up here on the stage, but I, I just wanna, I just, I always think about the, the two times that Ruben um, ended up getting really, really sick. And, um, I didn't realize how that would affect our marriage. Like you would think when he, he got better, everything should just go right back to normal. And I think that's just something that I want to put out there is that really anytime there's something big, traumatic, any big change in your marriage, having children, having them leave the home, you name it, even a job change and definitely illness, it changes your marriage. And you have to be, you know, you have to be ready. You have to be ready. And if you're in touch with God, you're, you know, you're praying. That's what you do. You, you go to, you go to God's word, and you pray, and you ask God to help you because the truth is, there's no manual out there that tells you, okay, when this happens, then do this. Because that's how I'm wired. I want to know what do I need to do. And God doesn't work that way. He just, he just, you know what? He helps you along the way. And God won't let you down if you go to Him and ask Him for help. He would, he's so good to respond and to, and to give you guidance. I have to read this next uh, highlight that we did. Uh, comb your hair and put on some nice clothes. Just because you've hooked him or her doesn't mean you should let yourself go. And I thought, that's so good. We went out the other day. I don't know where you went, baby. Texas Roadhouse or something like that. But she came down the stairs, and she was all dressed up and dolled up. And I was like, wow, you look great. And I'm like in a hoodie and my baseball hat and jeans. And she goes like, you going, you going like that? And I was like, yeah. It's like we had to walk out the door. I felt this big. So you do have to be. Any other guy know what I'm talking about? It's like, this is it. This is it. This doesn't happen by accident. You know what I mean? And anyway, so, uh, so we went out. But I have to be mindful of that. I have to be mindful of that. Rule number three, learn to be a better communicator. Hello. Uh, one study said, most often, people in relationships say they argue about tone of voice and attitude. Isn't that interesting? Tone of voice. If I tell Grace, Grace, well, now, you hear that? Grace? So before we even start, she knows I'm already like, I'm setting myself up for failure just by my tone of voice. And tone of voice really does matter. Uh, or your spouse knows it. Those who live with you know it. Those who you do life with, they know it. So uh, manage your tone of voice. I don't think that's said enough. I don't think that's talked about enough. But manage your tone of voice and your attitude. Attitude smell, I'll just tell you. Some, I mean, it, it, you know what kind of attitude somebody, somebody is in. Um, you want to talk about, oh, this, check this out. Gary Thomas, dating advice. Here it is. He said this, 
however much, oh, check this out, ladies, girls, women, uh, however much, I say that right, Kaylee? She's always, she's trying to correct me. I'm, I'm getting better at my words. However much your boyfriend talks to you while dating, cut that down by at least 25% after marriage. Isn't that good? <laughs> However much your boyfriend talks to you while dating, cut that down by at least 25% of your marriage. I don't know if that's a good, a good quote or not. Um, you want to keep going, baby? Sure. You want to listen. I think that's really important in a marriage. Uh, I don't know how you can um, really work on a marriage if you're not going to listen, right? So being a good communicator means you also have the ability to listen. Just because you think you know what your partner is going to say doesn't mean you shouldn't listen. So even if you know what they're, they're going to say, it's really a good thing. It's really a good thing to just listen. Because listening is something that we have to learn. It's something, it's like, a, it's a muscle that we have to exercise. Because we're always thinking in, in communication, and if anybody's done any inner communication class or or a, a skill class they'll tell you that you need to stop and listen because what happens when you're not listening is you're you're forming what you're going to say right and so you don't really hear what what they're saying to you and so often you know the when there's something going on when there's um, conflict and your spouse is sharing what's happening in in, in their heart, you, when we listen, when I listen, you, I give this opportunity to have him open his heart to me. And I've come to understand that that's really a gift and it's, a, it's, it's really precious. And I want to be careful with that because I want him to continue to open up his heart to me. Um, so it's not just listening with your ears, but it's listening with your heart, it's listening with your mind. And when you don't know what to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, or I'm going to give you this advice because it's helped me a lot. I often ask God, I just, just cry out to him and I'll ask him, Lord, help me. What do I say? What do I say now? Because my words aren't usually enough or, or they don't have the healing power that comes only when God gives me the words. That's when I know that those words are of him. Um, because words uh, can communicate a lot of healing and a lot of love. I think the other thing we've learned too is like uh, we can repeat ourselves. Like I can tell her, hey, this is bothering me or this. And like I'll tell her again, like in 10 different ways, the same thing. And she'll be like, well, you already told me that. But for me, I'm still working through it. It's not out of my heart yet. It's not cleaned yet. But learning to listen it's so important. What was that song? Do you remember that song we, we were working out today in the, in the basement? And it, there was... Toby Keith. What is it, those lyrics? I, Some of you guys might know this song with I'm Toby Keith. I'm not a Toby Keith. Uh, I mean... But it I was something know. about you talk of all about yourself. What about now me? Now it's my turn to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's my turn to talk. You know that song? Yeah, yeah. that's it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great song. Oh, my word. Uh, yeah, I thought, gosh, there are people who they love talking about themselves. Yeah. But they, they don't ask about you. They don't ask about how you're doing. So you gotta, I, I want to make sure I, I, I say this. Um, put the cell phone down. Put the cell phone down. Uh, it's, it's okay to look at the cell phone every once in a while. I get it. Uh, you know, you want to see what's happening and track Taylor Swift's flight or something. I don't know. But um, not me. But anyway, um, but, uh, but I, when we have to listen and when we're engaging with each other, you have to be able to, it's not like looking, yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening, go ahead. It means something different when we put it down and we spend time with each other. Or you, or you keep it in your pocket when you're eating or whatever it might be. Um, do we have time? Why don't you go through the lack of emotional intelligence real quickly and then we'll go to the last one. So people who lack emotional intelligence um, frequently say these phrases. And, you know, see if they, if they ring a bell with you. The first one is calm down so when you say that you're communicating again we're talking about communication you're communicating that you, that what they're feeling isn't important because you're telling them to calm down um, what about you always or you never right well that's usually not true <laughs> and so the problem with these statement is that it's just not true and no one like and, and the other person usually feels attacked right when you say those words 
And the truth is no one likes to feel attacked. And what about, that's just who I am. Like, this is who I am. Um, when you say that, you're communicating um, that, that it's not your fault. And so nobody wants to hear that, right? The other person doesn't want to hear that uh, there's no potential for growth. I mean, everybody has the ability to grow. Even if you're, you know, you could be whatever age, we're always growing and we're always learning. Sounds like an excuse or you're avoiding responsibility and uh, you're just... Uh you're just not choosing to continue to change and you're done. Uh, number four, rule number four, take care of your soul. If this is something that I, I think uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know how much this is talked about in marriage stuff. When we did a marriage um, conference, we, we led it in Corpus Christi. And I made sure we talked about this to the crowd. Um, it's so important that she takes care of her soul and I take care of my soul. It's just super, super critical. And it's a daily, daily decision. That means I got to make sure I'm spending time with God. I got to make sure I'm praying. I got to make sure um, I'm uh, every morning, you know, I'm reading or praying or seeking God's will. I got to make sure I go on retreats too. I got to make sure she goes on retreats and I hang out with one of the guys or she hangs out, goes to a women's Bible study, whatever it is. Take care of your soul. Take care of your soul. Are you going to read Proverbs 4.23? Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Mm. So managing your soul life is the most productive thing you can do in your marriage life. Mm. So it, it seems like for, rule number one and rule number four really do go together. If there's a mistake that I've seen, maybe even in churches, it's like one person really is trying to put God first and the other person's not. And typically the one who's like not doing it with that intensity, they're kind of like, well, you know, I'm just riding on the coattails of my wife or husband or whatever it is. So it's like, yep, I am. Yep. I have a good relationship with God through him or through her. And what I've discovered is it's important for each one, each person to work on their relationship relationship with God. Serving God together, faithfully attending church together. Grace and I, we've always, you know, when we were early on in our marriage, you know, she was, we were living in, in Austin at the time, and she was four days a week in San Antonio, going to the University of Texas in San Antonio, and I was uh, working full-time at a job um, doing sales, and then we were also giving 15 hours a week as volunteers in youth ministry at the church we were at. So we only had two or three days a week with each other, and we were both working, going to school, homework, all that stuff, and we were serving God together on the weekends. And the Lord just took care of it. And and it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful time. I st we still have, you know, some of those students from way back when, um, they are still friends with us, and they message me and all that stuff. But God bless that ministry. We grew it to about 50 or 60 teens and during those days. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. But serving God together is very cool. Serving God. So it's, it's don't have the attitude of it's, it's her thing or it's his thing. Don't do that because uh, your soul matters just as much to God. Uh, I want to put also this. Go on walks with uh, your spouse. And Grace and I, we, baby, we go on walks. And she loves to walk. And she's a fast walker. She's always wanting to go really fast. I don't know what she's in a rush about. But I like slowing down. I'll take a picture of the leaf or the tree or whatever it is. And, and I, just, I just chill. You know, I'm strolling, but she's going. But we have great talks while we walk. I don't know if there's something about walking and freeing your mind or whatever it is. But we talk about anything and everything. We're on walks. You want to talk about walking a little bit? You want to say anything else about that? Well, I mean, it's just what you said. It's, it's we, you know, it's just really good time together. We just talked about how... Um, couples do not spend enough time together. Yeah. And so you have to make these very, um, very dedicated moments. Even if you have to put it on your calendar, mm -hmm. create dates, whatever it is that you have to do, be, be very mindful and deliberate about spending time with each other. That's really, really important. Um, I, I can't, I mean, we need that. So, because marriage is, is, 
a lot of things that come together, isn't it? It's not just one thing. We just talked about the spiritual life. We talked about physical life. We've, you know, we mentioned just about everything that goes into a marriage. Every one of those is very important. But all of that comes together when you spend time together. I mean, that's just important. Um, I, my, my fav, one of my favorite authors is Gary Thomas, and if you read any of his stuff out there, it is meant for marriage. It is really well done, a lot of research. Um, he's a really um, a, a great guy. And he says, marital intimacy is built via thoughtful, God-powered perseverance and commitment to keep doing small things that feed relational intimacy. So you have to be purposeful. It's not just the big things. Obviously, the big things matter. But it's the everyday, the little things. It's the attitude. It's waking up in the morning, being very aware that this other person is beautiful and amazing and a gift to you. And that we have to treat this other person um, as a gift from God. Like if we have that attitude, it really changes everything. It starts in that morning and then, you know, throughout the day. And into the night. All of that really matters. All those small things kind of stitch together to make a beautiful story and really a powerful marriage. Well, to wrap this up, guys, um, I want to say if, if uh, you are uh, in, in your marriage, you just need some help, um, let us know. Let us know. We want to try to help out. And you can scan that QR code in front of you, send us an email, whatever. And let us know we want to help. A lot of times, you know, we, we live in, you know, an Instagram social media age where it's all about image and we don't tell others, well, I need help. I don't know what to do. And, uh, you know, I'm working with a couple right now that is, I don't know, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know if they're going to make it. And there's a lot of those stories. There's just a lot of stories. And I'll tell you what, uh, being a Christian, you can go to church all the time and still have marriage problems. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's a, it, it is a, something that we all have to grow in. So let us know. And, and I just encourage you to seek God right now with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, nobody's going to fix you, only God. So you, put, you seek God right now first. It would be, for those of you who are single, it would be a gift for that future person if you take care of your soul right now. It would be a gift for them. And, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a beautiful gift. So this is the last thing I want to leave you with is some homework. You want to share the homework? So, uh, like I told you, Gary Thomas is one of my favorite authors. And he uh, actually has uh, this part in, um, he gives this advice in one of his books. And so I'm going to give, I'm going to share it with you. It's really fun. And it doesn't matter if you've been married a few weeks, a few months to, you know, many, many years. I want you to do this this week. And um, I, you know, I think what he, he recommends that you try to do this as often as possible. And you have to put it in your calendar. So are you ready? If you're ready to take notes, you might want to do this right now because, and you have to have little check marks. All right. You want to have a 30 minute talk a 30-second kiss, and a three-minute prayer. So those are threes, right? So try that. Try that at least once this week. And I, I'd love to know, or I'd love to, we'd love to hear how this can start something really special in your marriage. Some of you guys are like, I like that middle one. That one looks really good. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for being with us, God. Uh, God, I'm so grateful that you're still in the business of changing lives. I'm so grateful, God, that you're a God of new beginnings. I know some of us here, Lord, whether we're single and we're uh, wherever we're at in our season of life, I pray also, I, I just want to pray for those of who are single right now, who are online or in person, would you just continue to minister to their soul? Give them peace and trust in you, God. Um, they're incredibly valuable for your kingdom. All of, their, all of us have gifts and strengths, and I just pray you give them that peace that you're in control. I pray for those who are married. I pray that you invade every marriage. I pray that you invade every soul. We need you, God. I know the devil would love nothing more than to divide, to bring division in homes and churches and families and all that stuff and we just we just say no to the devil in the name of Jesus and we choose to fight for for your purpose God so thank you for being with us thank you for your presence thank you Jesus for coming into our crazy world and thank you 
for your love and your mercy. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you just stand up for a second? Let's, let's thank God for his word. Can you put your hands together?